Namaste. So last time we talked about eternalism and the fact that it has consequences. In other words, you might say, well, it's just a belief. But beliefs reflect in our thoughts, words, and actions. And especially in terms of spiritual realization. So whether we think that truth is eternal, or whether we think we're living in the forever now, has real consequences oh, in terms of so many things. And we're going to go into that in this video. First of all, I want to make a remark about the opening scene, the credits or the title. That is a, uh, a painting taken from a video from a Thai monastery. And talk about eternalism. Oh, boy. See, they imagine this static, sterile, pure, eternal Buddha land. And that's where you go if you realize Buddha's teaching and you become just like Buddha. You see, the room is filled with all these identical statues. So you become a Buddha just like the other Buddha. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, there's, there's no dirt. There's, everything is geometric, you know, and, and uh, uh, symmetrical and, and like that. They have this kind of totally intellectual uh, idea of some after-death state. And that's where you go by practicing this teaching. Well, I wouldn't want to go there. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be just like anybody <laughs> except myself. Actually, the Buddha himself contradicts this because in his description of Paticca Samuppada, he acknowledges that it was actually discovered by a previous Buddha, Buddha Vitasi not by himself. And so he describes Buddha Vitasi's life. And Buddha Vitasi did not, like our, uh, our own Buddha, our current Buddha, he did not go through tremendous austerities. But simply by wisdom, simply by contemplation, he discovered the noble norm of Paticca Samuppada. And that's what the next series is going to be about, by the way. So I'd like to discuss a little bit more about eternalism versus timelessness and their consequences. First of all, the most noticeable consequence of eternalism is dogmatic authoritarian organizations. And of course, you can see this in every religion, every spiritual path, huh? that there are people who put the whole thing on a, on a dogmatic, literalist, intellectual platform. And they don't rely much on practices, huh? but it's all talk, talk, talk. And there's an over-reliance on hierarchy, authoritarianism, Huh? Because it's all a fabrication. The idea that anything that exists can be eternal is basically imagination. <laughs> if it exists, if it has shape and form, then it has a beginning and an end. So it involves suffering. So if you really want to get beyond suffering, you have to go beyond form. So... While organizations that are eternalistic are usually seen as dogmatic, those that are timeless follow the non-dogmatic inquiry method. And that means you hear something and then you look into it for yourself. For example, some people have, have written me that why don't you give more meditation methods in your videos. 
Well, everything in my videos is a meditation method. That's all they are. Huh? So, but you have to apply it. It's not like I'm going to give a step-by-step -step list of instructions, you know. It's up to you to figure it out, how to apply it in your own life, uh, in your own situation. Everybody's different. Everybody's unique. So if I give, a, you know, by the book list of instructions, it's going to work for a few people, but certainly not for all. So it's up to you to use your initiative, intelligence, and creativity to figure out how to apply it. For example, in the previous series, I was talking about Sankara and that Sankara Nirodho uh, means that consciousness, objective or uh, conditioned consciousness disappears. So that's not just a philosophical statement, that's a basis of a practice. You should look at your own uh, mind, identify the Sankara, stop them, and see what happens. Isn't it? I mean, does it, do I have to like spell everything out, A, B, C? You know, I don't know sometimes, maybe I do. But anyway, non-dogmatic inquiry means exactly that. You hear something, you try it. Or you look directly into yourself to find the answers to questions. You don't rely on outside authorities. That's very dangerous. Huh? That can get you in all kinds of trouble. But basically, people who do this are lazy. They don't want to look into things for themselves. They don't want to discover the truth for themselves. They want somebody to give it to them free. Huh? It's not going to happen. <laughs> If you ask someone their opinion, of course, it's going to be biased. It's going to be biased toward what benefits them. So authoritarianism is a big danger. You should uh, get rid of that attitude. It allows you to be exploited. And instead, free inquiry into the truth. Uh, that's the way to go. Okay, and next we see in eternalistic religion the view of eternal identity or the soul. Uh, and this has crept into Buddhism too. You know, like the Pure Land Buddhists and, and all of that. Um, and most of the Orthodox Buddhists, even Theravada Buddhists today, interpret Paticca Samuppada to mean that there's a past, present, and future. That's eternalism, because it's time. And in the future, they're going to go to some exalted uh, heavenly or spiritual Buddha land, you know, and live eternally with the Buddha. Isn't that great? No, it's not great. <laughs> because it means a continuation of suffering. They're going to be under somebody's authority, they're going to have to conform to all these rules and regulations. I mean, it's actually kind of hellish. So just like I wouldn't want to belong to an organization, really any organization, <laughs> but especially one that has lots and lots of rules, limiting my freedom and autonomy, I certainly wouldn't want to go to some after-death state that requires adherence to some kind of organization. It's like, wait a minute, no, that's not what this is about. This is about freedom. Uh, so in the actual Buddhist teaching, he taught detachment, not that you are a soul, uh, but to be detached from this personal identity. Because personal identity, really what it means is the body. Uh, well, people may say, oh, no, I identify with my mind. Yeah, but the mind is part of the body. <laughs> the mental awareness is one of the six senses. So the Buddha actually rejects all that and counsels nirodo, cessation, detachment, virago, 
eternalism fosters personality view. In other words, I'm a person, uh, I have all of these qualities and attributes and activities and possessions and activities and stuff, and uh, that's who I am. Well, the only problem with that is that it's always changing. You know, when we're a small child, we have a different set of tastes than when we're an adolescent, and then it also changes again when we become uh, an adult, and then when we reach middle age, old age, and so on, all of our mental uh, qualities and tastes change, our priorities change, our ideas, everything. Uh, so to have a personality means to be subject to change. And then, oh, because a personality is a fabrication, a sankara, we always have to use a lot of time and energy to maintain it. So we want to get rid of personality view, and that means cessation of self. And that's the Buddha's timelessness view, that self goes away. The next thing eternalism uh, brings up is eternal consciousness. Consciousness in the Buddha's teaching means awareness of an object. So the problem is then the consciousness becomes established on the object. And when the consciousness becomes established on something external, huh, then it tries to grasp all these other things. Well, the problem is that whatever it's established on isn't permanent, isn't stable. Huh? It's always changing. So why would one want to be established on something that's always changing? You know, I don't get it. So in, in the Buddhist teaching, the actual Buddhist teaching, consciousness is dependently origin, arisen. Consciousness arises by causes, and the chief cause are sankharas and name and form. We'll get into that in the next series in great detail. <laughs> Another thing that we get from eternalism is positivism. The idea that everything can be expressed in words and that these words are real. These ideas and thoughts and concepts have some reality. Well, of course, the Buddha's teaching is apophatic. So he teaches apophysis. We don't talk about the things that we can experience. Why? Huh? We can experience them. The reality is there, independent. Whether we think about it, or whether we have words and ideas about it or not. So there's no need to talk about it, no need to speak about it. We can speak about the way to get to it. We can speak about maybe some of its qualities or something like that. The benefits of being in the reality. But there's no need to talk about the reality itself. Hmm? Poor Cosmo Joe. He thinks, <laughs> oh yeah, that's the other side of eternalism too. The authoritarianism breeds rebellion, which becomes nihilism or nihilism, depending on what side of the planet you're from. And nihilism means there's nothing after death. So what does that result in? Addiction to sense enjoyment. And our whole society today, because of science, science is strongly nihilistic. Uh, and uh, because of science, everybody has become basically addicted to sense gratification. And uh, of course, that simply creates all kinds of bad karma for the future. It's a really dangerous situation because authoritarianism breeds rebellion. But because they have no other knowledge, all they can do is invert eternalism and it becomes nihilism. You know, like the Christians who become Satanists, huh? or the Satanists whose, whose uh, uh, 
religious service is basically the Catholic Mass recited backwards. Huh? So you can take anything, anything, and just turn it upside down and invert it. But that's not very creative, is it? <laughs> but anyway, going on. Another problem with eternalism is objectivism. Objectivism is the idea that the world is real, huh? that there's a bunch of things out there, objects, and that those have real existence. And of course, that we can own them and enjoy them and so on like that. We live in an objectivist society. Our language is objectivist. So it's very, very difficult to get free from the objectivist trap. But what does the Buddha say? Subjectivism. It's not that consciousness arises in the world as another object. No, the world arises in consciousness. And as we've stated many times, the proof of this is that when our consciousness changes, the world disappears. As soon as we go to sleep at night, we're in another world. But what happened to the original one? It's just gone. It's not accessible until we change our consciousness back and wake up. So that means that the world, the world, huh? another one of those aggregates, <laughs> abstractions, sankara, the world is simply a bunch of phenomena. And when we tune into it, it seems to exist. Huh? It's like a television channel. When we tune into the channel, there's the program. And then we, we click away and it's gone. And finally, eternalism leads to rebirth and suffering. Why? Because when there's a past and a present, or a present and a future, there can be change. And when there's change and action, and then there's cause and effect, then there's karma. Huh? See where this is going? <laughs> As soon as you have karma, then you have rebirth. And of course, as soon as you have birth, you have suffering, old age, decay, death, all the negatives of ordinary existence. So the Buddha's answer to that is moksha. Moksha, liberation in the here and now. Freedom. Huh? Well, what does freedom mean? That you don't participate in the whole eternalistic illusion, maya. Huh? But you accept reality for what it is. The world is impermanent, it's unsatisfactory, and it's not self. So you let the world be the way it is, huh? and you be the way you are. <laughs> Unconditioned, objectless awareness. And that is the real Sub, sum and substance of the Buddha's teaching. Just be natural. Huh? You already are part of the whole. By making an effort to individualize yourself, you turn yourself into an object, a personality, huh? an individual. And because of that, you have to suffer. Whereas in the whole, there's no suffering. In fact, the whole is ecstatic. But then there's no you. There's no individual. There's no identity or personality. Uh, there's nobody to experience the results of karma. So there's no karma. This is the secret of the Buddha's teaching. It takes a while to get through our thick heads. But once we get it, oh, it's so liberating. Buddha Sardanai.